Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. Our virus is alive? Okay, here we are in student discussion of week two of the course, Are We Alone? Well, how did we get here? And today we'll be talking about week two, which is about our evolution over the past 20 million years. And good morning, guys. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. And Beck, what, tell us, lead us off. So, my first question was in one of the first slides, uh, was there a great turning point for this scientific thinking, say in the Grecian or ancient Middle East, uh, and the biggest sort of part of that is, did it coincide with any sort of event that we know of, like a climactic event, or was it just sort of the conglomeration of all these cities and then all these people coming together and that sort of sparked? Well, I think it's the latter. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, when you start to have big cities, then you have to have, you know, organization. And that's when writing started. But if you're asking if science started because of a volcano, I would say <laughs> you know, yeah. no. Uh, but, you know, that's a question so hard to answer. Usually the answer is it's complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there's any one thing that you can say, well, if this happens, then you get cities and science. Yeah. Well, I don't think you can say that. It's kind of like history is one damn thing after another, I think is a more appropriate description of <laughs> as far as we can tell. So what about this one? Yes, you brought up a lot about this sort of the 19 uh, sub subspecies of human would be African and then one would be Eurasian and other Africans. And you kept saying, oh, can this cure racism? I strongly doubt that it could. Uh, also, how is, so my question was, how is distinguishing these groups, especially white Eurasian groups, as this like one other group, not putting these different subspecies against each other, and doesn't it just add more fuel to the fire? Well, well first of all, it doesn't isolate white Eurasian as one group. Matter of fact, in this grouping, at this level, white Eurasians plus Indians plus Chinese plus Australian Aborigines are in the same subspecies. As you can see here on the, the one that the yellow ones there, the non-Africans. So yeah. why I think, it, I, I first thought this when I was listening to a geneticist talk about how it's important to figure, they were complaining about all the studies being done on white males. Mm -hmm. And he says how it's important to say, wait, if you have African Americans, you have to put them in a separate category because they have slightly different genes and therefore we need different kind of medicines. But then I say, wait a minute, African Americans come from a whole mixture of populations from Africa and to put them in one category is silly. Mm -hmm. So, but that is the classic racism. And I said, wait a minute, we can tell by looking at the genes, this is what we can tell, that there are different groups in Africa. There's more variety in Africa than anywhere else. And so I said, if you, since you recognize that, then you can use that for the medicine because that's what you need to do if you want to figure out, hey, medicine for this more genetic group and this genetic group is slightly different. And we found that out. And if we want to pretend that, oh no, all Africans are in the same group, that's crazy racism. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is the way in which it's uh, productive to understand the variety of human genes. Of course, in the last 500 years, everybody's going everywhere. We're, we're moving ever around. So all kinds of populations are mixing with other kinds. And so that former isolation, which was reflected in the isolated language, languages, have now starting to mix. I had a follow-up question to that yeah. uh, we're all African statement. Yeah. I think it does ignore the, I mean, I'm speaking from my experiences, and but I can't speak for everyone else. It does uh, sort of have slight erasure of experiences of African people. And if we say, oh, we're all Africans, like we can, I relate to you. Like I know the struggles you've been through, uh, it, but then it, you ignore the social implications uh, of what it means to uh, have darker skin in these times. And yes. I mean, with the whole current Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Yeah. I should point out that it's also a little bit misleading to say that we're African because hmm. look at the great apes. The great apes, orangutans, Huh. They're not in Africa. They're in Southeast Asia, mm. Sumatra, for example. And so, there, so we. N but the chimpanzees and gorillas are in Africa. So we think five million years ago, ten million years ago, maybe as far as thirteen million years ago. Yes, our ancestors were in Africa, but we know that uh, the great apes, primates in general, are not Afrotheres like elephants. We know that they weren't there for a long time. 
So if you want to talk about your even more distant ancestors, they're probably, we're not all Africans, we're probably all Eurasia Thayers, mm. Laurasia Thayers. And so it really depends on how far back you want to talk about where your ancestors were. Yeah. So it gets really arbitrarily complicated, mm. kind of like your ancestors say, oh, I'm Irish and German. Oh, oh, wait a minute, this Irish person also, I married this Italian person. And then you get further and further back, it just becomes a, a free-for-all. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting complex and that's the way human history seems to be yeah. this is a gross simplification mm. but uh, yeah it's all about frame of reference yeah frame yeah. Of reference and how far back in the past mm. huh? so what about this oh yes so what actually governs the ah. rules of subspecies because even with like neanderthals and the I can't, I, the denisovans ne denisovans if they could interbreed doesn't that sort of cross the definition of a species which is defined usually as being able to interbreed? Yeah, well, this is, a, this is one of the biggest problems of, of anthropology, mm. and that's why we talk about the lumpers and the splitters. Yeah. Uh, and the simplest thing is, hey, if they can interbreed, they're the same species, right? That's what you want to say. That means if... And you, and you know that, that, or I know too, that 2.3 uh, or 2.5 percent of your genes come from Neanderthals. Mm. So, that means our ancestors, some of my ancestors were Neanderthals, so there was interbreeding going on. I would say, well, that kind of that suggests to me that we should call them the same species. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that, then you have to say it's not Homo neanderthalensis; it's Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Yeah. So you add that subspecies on. Now, in reality, evolution is very continuous, and you know, here's one yeah, species not... growing, growing, and then it kind of divides and it comes back and divides, and there's hybridization going on, and then they separate by a mountain or a river or something, yeah. and then they're divided, mm -hmm. and then for a while they can still interbreed if some adventurer climbs a mountain or goes across yeah. the river, but then they so they're isolated so much that they can't interbreed very successfully anymore, and that takes a, you know maybe a million years, maybe two, maybe even ten million years. So, yeah. but during that process, you're creating. Uh, you have subspecies that are mildly isolated, and then they become species if they re maintain their isolation. So these three groups here, for example, this Tampanuli one has just been found. And, you know, <laughs> as not being an orangutan expert, where it's hard for us to tell what's a different species or not, but the problem is that ecologists who are desperately trying to save the great apes mm -hmm. want to call it a different species because only then will lawmakers protect this species uh, because if it's a I subspecies see. they say oh we can interbreed it's not really something <laughs> worth protecting and it can disappear and they said no you can't it's very important yeah. so there's a gigantic political battle coming <laughs> into science because of that uh -oh. and they are well motivated but I think they're stretching the science to say oh it's a different species but they're, in reality there's no using discrete words is not the way to go when you're going <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah I've got the same question later on did, so is there a binary definition of subspecies versus not subspecies? They, they would love there to be one, but I would say forget it. It's silly. It's a continuous process of uh, speciation. And, you know, so, um, uh, well. and how about this? There are subspecies, but then this subspecies has sub-subspecies, right? No, don't, it's no, like the bush. No, no, it depends no. on where you want to cut it. No, it's not crazy. That's the, that's the reality. What's crazy is the discretization mm. of the natural continuous process of speciation. That's fair. I like subspecies because that's what the biologists use for every other animal. Mm. Now, I should also point out that the word species is something that's only appropriate for sexually reproducing organisms. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to talk about species of, yeah. of bacteria and even harder, species of Viruses, mm. you know, uh. so it's really associated with sexual reproduction, which is only in the last two billion years. The question of whether science would evolve again. Yeah, that was yeah. my similar to mine. Yeah, yeah. Right. Are there reasons for the development of science from not science? And do you think that's a common thing? So, well, that's the question. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Follow up, <laughs> the follow up question is Is the opposite ever true? So, is it ever a bad idea to be smart? Wait, wait, do you think science is smart? Is that what you just said? Uh, yeah, I'd <laughs> Let's just be as quick as I could. <laughs> well, is, is it, it a ever a bad idea to have science? Well, uh, is it? I don't we'll know. We'll find out very soon. We now have many ways of killing yeah. ourselves. <laughs> We're about to find out in the next thousand years. Uh, <laughs> and, well. I, and I think it's probably the, the answer is yes, it's bad to be able to kill yourself because eventually huh. maybe you do. Is maths a fundamental thing of the universe? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, that's. That. A lot of people want to try to communicate with these smart aliens with maths. Mm. And uh, my take on that is, oh, wait a minute, what is our, our testing of communication, interspecies communication on Earth, do we use math to do that? If you want to talk to a dolphin, you don't use math. You use 
Now, what successful talks have been maybe music. Because some guys go out in a boat and play a flute, and then the dolphins come around and say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But if you start saying two plus two is four, eh, yeah. <laughs> nothing. So the idea that math is the universal language, maybe, maybe music is, or maybe touching is, maybe you know, fe feeling. Because when you want to talk to a horse, what do you do? You rub the horse, and say, hey, it's okay. So, and the same with dogs, and the same with a lot of other mammals. Not with reptiles, they don't like to be touched, yeah. apparently. So th that only works with mammals who we have a common ancestor with about 160 million years. Reptiles, you know, more like 300, and they don't like to be touched. So it's yeah. obviously not a universal feature. So I don't know what the aliens... <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's the entire plot of the movie, Close Encounters of the Third Time. Close yes. Encounters yes. of the Third Time. Yes, yes. Very quick question. <clears throat> Why is the genome shown as a circle? I have another question. Why aren't these a circle? What the... The reason I'm asking that is because bacteria have circular genomes. Really? Yes. Huh. And mitochondria, you know, we're free-living bacteria, so of course it has a circular ge genome. There you go. Thank so, you very much. <laughs> That's it, pretty what, cool. Another weird thing about this, you see how they're arranged by size, the number one chromosome is the biggest, etc.? Yeah. Now, the other apes have one more chromosome, and the two. and yeah, yeah. The, the two other two of them came together and formed number two, right, in ours. Yeah. And so, but most people think, oh, a different number of chromosomes. But, it's chromosomes just like arbitrary packaging. It's not as fundamental as you might think. That's and, and, uh, but the circular part of have DNA, that's something that I, I'm pretty sure all bacteria even, I mean, archaea and bacteria have it, plus the huh. plasmids that bacteria exchange are circular, plus you have right now inside your body not only mitochondrial DNA, um, you have plasmids in there, and they are also <laughs> circular. Uh, I personally love... Uh, evolutionary history and anthropology and that stuff. So it was really interesting to learn about the progression of human history, but then also how we're similar and different to the other great apes. I yeah, like the, when you mentioned the Sapiens book, I, I'm currently reading it and I love it. Would well, you think this week relates to the question, "Are we alone?" Well, how did we get here? Do yeah, because it's showing how complex it was to get to this intelligence niche. Uh, that that um, we will fight about will later fight on. About. <laughs> and the worst thing about this week? Oh, uh, I can't think of anything at the moment. Oh, come on, come on. Um, <laughs> did I write anything down? Oh, some of the, um, yeah, the sort of things that I brought up before about the fixing racism. I think that's a bit hard to do. Yeah. I'm shoot. I'm aiming too high. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, people will, like anti-vaxxers, for instance, take any sort of science and try to use it and then ignore all the other science. But, that does, but, but does that really mean you shouldn't do the science because it can be exploited? I mean, should Oppenheimer have worked on the yeah. bomb project? I think we should always take into consideration, because people try to separate science and politics so much, mm, yeah. but you can't because science exists in this world with politics. Mm. So I think it's very, very important to always acknowledge the political implications of any scientific discovery or classification. It's kind of like when I traveled to a country, I said, well, the stereotype is true. And then I realized, hey, but it's not bad. You know, you go to different countries, they're different people, they have different... Cru and then you say, oh, they're all like this, they're all like this. And you kind of look down because from your culture, it's stigmatized. But then you live there and say, wait a minute, this is a kind of good too. Mm -hmm. And so I think the implications of the differences are what you need to jettison, not the knowledge of the differences. Well, the, the bad was the fact that I didn't think it was going to be good well, that's until your I saw it. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Find myself. <laughs> but I, I really, I also really like that part about uh, talking about how your common ancestor with the chimps isn't a chimp and it's not a human. No, no, no. So humans no. didn't evolve from chimps. Chimps didn't evolve from humans. Yes. It's actually something Just completely something. different. I thought, uh, isn't that a great insight? So simple and it so is. true. It is, and it was well worded. Uh, un I, unless yeah. you I, believe that chimps have not evolved in 7 million years, and uh, we have. Week 2, our evolution over the past 20 million years. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, first reactions was I was really surprised. I suppose actually surprised isn't the word, but I found it really valuable at the discussion of the human brain. Like brain size and civilization quotient, you know, and once the video was over, I looked up, you gave like a little list of other uh, things that we could judge our brain on compared to other life on Earth. And one of them was just the number of neurons. And my guess was like, surely we're going to be up there. And I looked up the number of neurons in a dolphin brain. And it's like 2.5, more than 2.5 as much as we have. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's something that sort of I, I, I know that I'm coming into this with the assumption 
that humans are spectacular, mm -hmm. humans are fundamentally different, our mm -hmm. brains must be next level good. You are not alone in, yeah. that, in those assumptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, that's why you included it. Um, but that's something that I, it was valuable for me to learn, I think, taking, reassessing human brains. But I do want to push back a bit on human uniqueness mm -hmm. because there is no animal that, or any, actually, oh, wait, no, 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 I will, I will, I'll stick to animal. Okay, you're on only one animal, okay. That has had the same impact on such a diverse range of spaces and uh, biospheres as humans. Okay, let me stop you there. That's, that's a, okay, that's yeah. completely wrong. Okay. Let's take a breath. How much of the what you just breathed came from cyanobacteria, bacteria, and how much did you just breathe came from the CO2 from human beings, which we are now calling the Anthropocene because it's increasing? CO2 yeah. is 400 parts per million, mm -hmm. oxygen mm -hmm. is 20%. So who's in control here? Who has left the biggest signal on Earth? Not humans. But because we look at everything, you know, we're only interested in the humans. I mean, ants don't care about us. They just see what ants do in their trails and they smell the thing. Mm -hmm. That's what they pay attention to. What we pay attention to the same thing, our own species. We've been selected to do that. That doesn't mean we've left a giant footprint on it. I don't, you know, uh, nitrogen, I don't even know what nitrogen is produced by, whether that was abiotic or, or there's certainly a nitrogen cycle that is controlled by life forms, and it's certainly not humans. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll push back but, on you th saying that we are... Matter of fact, but no, no, go ahead, but go ahead, go ahead. These are things that don't have brains. Like we're talking about the uniqueness of humans and the uni uniqueness of brains. I'm not talking about brains, that. I'm, right? I'm pushing back on the uniqueness because I think, well, my saying, push back on this statement. Mm -hmm. Humans are unique just like every other species. Push back on that. Do you want to push back on that? Well, no. Every species is unique. It's adapted to its niche, right? Well, yeah, yeah. But like, okay, so maybe unique isn't the word that I should be using. But I don't... What do you want? Special, better, exceptional? No, no, no. I wouldn't use better... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe exceptional in a literal sense, as in it is the exception. Because, like, okay. You know why we're exceptional? Because we're the ones who Who's came up with the word exception. And you know? we're the ones who are creating the criteria for what makes you exceptional. Yeah. yeah. Dude, does that sound like a circle to you? But in the same, in the same, mm. at the same time, mm -hmm. like, very few... I can't think of any animals that have quite, like, the range of humanity, right? The or the adaptability of okay. humanity. Do you right? have a dog? I do, I Okay, do. do you think you can smell nearly as well as that dog? How many oh. times better is that dog's sense of smell than yours? I don't know, probably 200. Okay, so the dog has a range of 200 times what the most, obviously the most important thing in the world is not optics for primates, it's optical. For a dog, it's smelling. Mm -hmm. So that dog looks at you and says, you can't smell anything. You have no range at all. But now, the same thing with elephants are even better. You know, elephants are like 10 times better than, than dogs at smelling. They have the most number of uh, sensors, or, or I guess the proteins that pick up things. I would love to have a sense of a smell of an elephant, and I think some physicist ought to be able to figure out, give humanity the ability to smell like an elephant. That would be a whole new world that we haven't explored yet, kind of like gravitational waves. I feel like we'd just be disgusted at ourselves. Why? I'm sure I would smell awful if I had enough... No, no, all the Reception. emotions that are associated with the smell. My dog, your dog can eat poop, right? Yeah, yeah. Humans are disgusted by that. Dogs love it, right? Or they don't love it, they just Quite like frankly, it. frankly, that's not something that I want a scientist to take away from me. My aversion to poop. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, physicist, biologist here, I'm happy. I'm happy living in this particular type of experience. <coughs> okay, I would like to explore what it's like to be a dog or a bat mm -hmm. or a whale mm -hmm. or, a, or a tree. <clears throat> and you don't find that interesting? I don't know. Like a... I, I've evolved this squeamishness, right? <laughs> like, this isn't something that I decided. I'm happy with my squeamishness. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Like, All right. nature has I decided can... that I'm squeamish, and okay. I, will, I, will, I will cop that. <laughs> okay, okay. What about the idea of the Neolithic Rev I mean, if let's go back in history, I don't know, 20,000 years, mm -hmm. and then replay the tape of life. Do you think science would come back again? How specific I, I, is I, that? I... I I think it's, it's interesting that you're couching this in a discussion of the Neolithic Revolution because mm -hmm. I, I haven't quite got like, the thoughts around it, but my gut tells me that agriculture is more... Well, that's what ag agriculture is part of Neolithic. Agri yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So like, to me, agriculture is much more fundamental than science, right? Okay. <laughs> that's, maybe. Because, because as far as we can tell... It used to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know you, don't, you might not specifically agree with this, but agriculture, it appears to have developed independently. Mm, well, that's what yeah. I, I think yeah. I 
Uh, well, I think I disagree with that, but go you ahead. You do, yeah. But, mo- but most most experts in the area do disagree with you that's, that's as well. That's right, that's true. That's um, true. It seems to have developed independently, mm-hmm. whereas science, like what we call science, is a very Western-dominated yeah. institution. Well, they talk about the Greek scientists all the time, and then they talk about science in the last 200 years, and the word mm-hmm. science is only like 100 years old. And then they have Chinese science, if you're, and then they all Arabic science. They talk about all mm-hmm. these sciences, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like it's got different emphases. Yeah. But you could call it science, but it depends on what you mean by science, and you can make it specifically Western. Oh, it happens after Newton and the Enlightenment. Or you can say, well, wait a minute, these Greeks were doing something really interesting. Well, wait a minute, before them, the Babylonians. They, matter of fact, how you count you're 60 seconds in a minute, right? Where did that come from? That's that, kind of scientific. That's measuring that's things. Ba- that's from Babylonia. You know, yeah. So it's... Uh, but look, I think... Do we have any indication about the ability of electroengineers to make radio telescopes elsewhere based on what happened here? And that's why it's an important question to ask. But is... Okay. I can't... I, I don't have... There's no, there's no evidence to do with this at all because it's all hypothetical because we do live in that timeline where we developed science as we know it. But well, there are, no, there no, are, let me stop you there. Okay. Let's suppose that there are two cultures that have in contact with each other and both mm-hmm. developed radio telescopes mm-hmm. on Earth. That, I mean, when the Europeans started traveling around the world and they went to the New World, they had no idea. The New World could have had telescopes, but, but we, it didn't, but, right? But that can't ever, like, we can't really confidently know that at all because the technology required to build a radio telescope is so much more advanced than the technology required to travel around the globe, Right. Uh, well, at least at I, least in a human perspective, I really struggle to imagine a society that would build a radio telescope before they build caravels. Right, I, and that's not what I'm trying to imply. I'm trying to imply, though, that there are many aspects of human culture that we might be able to figure out whether we should expect them elsewhere or we should expect them again on Earth to have evolved because they're, I don't know, repeatable or they're so obvious or so constrained or so channeled by the environment that that would produce mm-hmm. it again. That's a giant argument in biology, mm-hmm. but it's even harder in cultural things, I mm-hmm. think. Coming back to the Neolithic revolution, mm-hmm. I think that agriculture, it appears to me, to, it, it's a, an emergent property from the fact that we're hunter-gatherers and we have certain... An emergent property? Wait, there are other hunter-gatherers and like other species and they're not, mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. not becoming... But farmers we have like we have maybe evolution just we lucked into a specific set of traits that allow that allowed that to develop we right? lucked into it or we f- or fell prey to that specific set of traits because okay, sure. agriculture did a lot well, of bad yeah, stuff you know yeah. but it and it but it's also the foundation for civilization it's it's pretty well it seems to be yeah. yeah it's pretty well uh, accepted that you need a, a calorie surplus t- in order to develop civilization or, and the or, way you do that is through agriculture. Or you could say that what agriculture does is have a calorie surplus to have a hierarchical society, which can have an army, which can beat the crap out of the hunter-gatherers. Mm-hmm. Not, not, that, but that's, like civilization still survives, and it doesn't require the, the, the defeat of... It sure does. It requires cities. The whole thing about civilization started in cities. Writing started in cities, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't have people hunting and gathering doing writing. It's a, the cities had to keep track of this, and then the hierarchical society, and then you have writing, and then you have armies, and then you have bigger armies, and then you have a food surplus from mm-hmm. agriculture, and then you can beat the poop out of everybody, and that's what happened. But sort of more key to that is that food surplus allows specialization. That's you know, exactly what I mean, not, military but, specialization. But more than military specialization. Yes, of course, of course, okay. of course. It's not the only thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's the thing, I think, that keeps agriculture... It, ke- it lets agriculture displace the other things that okay. used to be in the majority. Okay. I will... Well, but similarly, does it have to be entirely through military conquest? Usually, it could, yeah. But it, I, I don't it, know of any peaceful pushing out of people from, of hunter-gatherers. I don't, is it so much pushing out or bringing in to the fold, right? Usually, it starts with, uh, uh, I guess, uh, explorers. With like, mm. you, you just look at the history, of, and it starts with explorers who conquer, and then comes the pacification of the religion of the conquerors, mm-hmm. and then come the merchants who take advantage of everything, and then comes in what you call integration. So kind of like, I don't know if you heard about the story about Ishii the Indian, who's the last wild American Indian, 1910 mm-hmm. or something. Vaguely. So, so when America has decided, okay, they're no longer a threat, oh, the poor Indians, let's uh, mm-hmm. integrate them, and that's mm-hmm. the the notion. I think that it's not just in America, but I think everywhere that's the same. It tendency. certainly happened here. Yes, in Australia, yes, it happened almost. It has happened, I think, not just in the last thousand years, but in the last 10,000 years but or 100,000 years. How much of that is that we see how Western cultures 
behave this way and we're extrapolating, just I'm just... We're, we're extrapolating that out to all of humanity, right? I don't think, no, you ask anthropologists how peaceful, I mean, when, when you study what fraction of males die of warfare as a function of time, it's mm -hmm. not an increase with time. This is what Steve Pinker's point about, mm -hmm. you know, the angels of our better nature in his latest book shows, hey, wait, it's much more peaceful now and uh, that compared to your probability, if you were born, let's say, a thousand years ago in South America, mm -hmm. you know, m your likelihood of being killed by a neighboring tribe is much, much higher than it is now if you're born in, I don't know, Manaus in Brazil or something. I, I think those statistics uh, show something, but I'm not quite sure. So any last points about week two? Um, I just want to say I'm definitely team Jochen. You're definitely team Jochen. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's maybe, <coughs> maybe like younger generations are more right, cynical. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think that an increased understanding of our scientific history would lead to a diminished amount of racism. Okay, and I, uh, I represent the opposite opinion mm -hmm. on that. Right? Mm -hmm. So w what, what, is the mo what do you think is the weakest part of my argument? I think it, it, I think it, it overemphasizes science, science, scientific, it, over, it overstates science's role in the average person's worldview, I think. Um, well, and so sci racism isn't an uh, ideology that, fully, that is fully acceptant of the truth, right? When eugenics was largely considered accurate mm -hmm. by Western science, mm -hmm. it held on to that. When eugenics, when eugenics was debunked, mm -hmm. racism, racism didn't die out with it. It became much more of a, a cultural argument, right? A cultural phenomenon. And you move on to things like, I don't know, um, Reagan's welfare queens and that sort of stuff. It, it sticks around mm -hmm. by clinging to whatever argument it can find. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm. I agree with, definitely. With that. I'm all on board with that. But I still think that knowing more about the science of human differences, you have to get that racism out of your head and the stigma and say, hey, human beings are different in this way, this way. Isn't that interesting? But which, way, but which way does it go? You don't have right? to put a it's, high better or worse on it. It's not no, no, going no, anyway. No, I'm not saying better or worse. I'm saying mm. like in a timeline, mm. I think that if you, for people to accept that truth, that, sci that scientific fact and take it on as truth in their worldview. Well, wait, is it true then, that you have orange hair and I have brown hair? But that's the thing. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing. That type of non-stigmatized difference mm -hmm. are the way that everybody in the whole world is different from each other. And if we can arrive at that, that's science, that's natural, and that gets rid of racism. But go ahead, push back. But so the idea, you have brown hair, I have red hair, that's a lot more apparent. It's hard to, it's hard to debate. You, Skin color, you've you got, know, no pe size. Pe people are coming into this debate, you know, a lot of people still don't believe in evolution. Uh, yeah, you know? I know. Okay. And well. <laughs> so, like, now I you think, got me. I now think, you got I me. I think that in order to accept <laughs> the these facts as truth in yeah, your worldview, yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to come into it already, maybe yeah. not like entirely yeah. non-racist, but, right, right, right. but coming in with racist understandings. Yes, yes, you're yes. going to have a pushback against that because your opinions mm -hmm. aren't right, aren't right. there for fact, and we tend to stick to our opinions even when we have evidence that can disprove mm. them. Hmm. Well, hmm. it's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have you either so, stumped you or you want to move on? <laughs> well, both. Both. I, I mean, I, I, I could argue this for another, like I did with the mm. for so yeah. I went over. Yeah. 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 And I would do the same with you, but uh, let's, let's move on. Yeah. Let's move on.